Hello everyone and welcome to this Kids Matter Early Childhood webinar, Early Childhood Self-Regulation and Mental Health, What Can You Do? Thanks for coming today and as I can see from what people have been popping in the chat, we're from all over the place, across Australia and even internationally today, which is it's great to see all these people connecting. And it's very cold in lots of places too, which is something that we've, we've noticed and each of us presenters are sitting here shivering as well. So hopefully we can keep warm and keep engaged through our conversation today. So yet, those of you who haven't been involved in Kids Matter Early Childhood before, I'll just let you know that we're a national mental health initiative and we're funded by the Department of Health and Beyond Blue. And we've grown into the initiative that we are today through a great partnership between Beyond Blue, Australian Psychological Society and Kids Matter and Early Childhood Australia. We are meeting in this space today in an online environment, so we'll just run through a little bit of what you can do. But before we move into that, I'd actually like to also take a moment to, to just make sure everyone's aware to take care of themselves today. When we're talking about self-regulation, when we're talking about early childhood and mental health, sometimes different memories can be triggered and sometimes we need to seek support for those. You can find information in the announcement that's put down at the bottom of your screen at the moment for places to contact and places to go and who to speak to if you are seeking extra support. Now while we're on the announcements that are popping up at the bottom of the screen, I'll move into a little bit around different housekeeping things around how to make this place in this online environment work best for you. If you find that you've read the announcement and you want to get rid of it, there is a little cross to, at the top right that you can click on and that's, a, that's something you can do to get rid of that. There's also lots of lots of chat going on in the chat today, which is great. And, and I, I personally, I, I get a real blast about reading it all. But for some people, chat isn't for them. You can actually make the chat box disappear by clicking either the little triangle at the top of your at the top of the chat box or the triangle to the left. So you can make make it disappear completely. Or if you want it back again, you can click on that triangle. And we just just got that highlighted up there for you now to have a look at. You can also adjust the size of your screen just by hovering over the edges of each of the frames of the box that the dialogue boxes are in. So spend a little bit of time while we're doing these introductions to make it fit for you and, and we'll move on from there. Now before we go much further, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the many different lands that we're speaking on today. And we're all meeting together in this online environment, but we're all connected to different places as well. I'd like to acknowledge, I would like to pay my respects as well to the Elders past, present and future for their continuing custodianship of the land and the children of this land across the generations. I also ask that you, that today we explore together and consider identify ways to commit to intentional steps that, that we can each personally make towards reconciliation. And feel free to let us know in the chat about what, what sort of plans that you're making as well. Now, as I hand over to today's presenters, we have Sarah Thomas, an education consultant, and two of my favourite facilitators, Sandy Clark and Kenny Anderson. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello. So, so as they guide us today through our explorations I'd, and about how helping children, how we can help children develop regulation skills, please also keep in mind the history, traditions, and wisdom of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who learn and grow in many ways, including through connections, land, place, community and culture. Now, we'll, everyone will be having a little turn. I think the order of today is, is Penny will be having a bit of a conversation first. So Penny, you want to just give a shout out to everyone so everyone can, can touch base with you. Hi Penny. And then Sarah will be having a speak, having a conversation with us around self-regulation as well. Hi Sarah. Hi everyone. Hello. And Sandy will be talking a bit around how Kids Matter, Hi. how the Kids Matter framework, Hi Sandy, connects to self-regulation. Now Sandy is also going to spend a little bit of time now talking with us about what we will be covering in today's webinar. So I'll hand over to you now, Sandy. Thanks, Amelia, and hello everyone. So today's webinar, we'll be exploring children's ability to self-regulate and what educators can do to help. So with this webinar, we'll also look at the importance of self-regulation for adults who work with young children, young children, I should say. You'll find some supporting information in the previous webinars, and next to these will be on the resources list sent to you a few days after the webinar. 
Timmy will start by outlining the outcomes of the session, define what we mean by self-regulation and discuss why it's the current focus. Um, I'll go on to look at the links to Kismeta and Sarah, an expert practitioner, will outline an approach to supporting self-regulation using the case study of Chris to illustrate. Um, Penny and I'll add our reflections on the case study and we'll finish with another poll and final thoughts. So to get things going, I want you to start by thinking about what do you do each day so that you're more able to deal with the stresses that you encounter. And I'm going to hand back to Amelia um, for a poll. Okay, we'll just get that poll started now. So you can click as many of these different things that you like. We've got a multiple choice poll happening at the moment. But also, we can't list everything. So if you, if there's something else that you do, we'd love to hear from you in the chat about different things that you do. So at the moment, um, we've got, oh, we've, we've got a clear winner at the moment. And I'm sure you're all eager to find out what that is, but I'll give it a few more moments. Sarah, what do you particularly do in the morning? I do like to get up and go for a run. It wakes me up. Even if it is raining outside, I, I find that quite um, energising for me. I know lots of people probably wouldn't, wouldn't choose to do that, <laughs> but that's something I like to do. Excellent. Thank you. What about you, you, Penny and Sandy? Yeah, I like to have a cup of tea and a very healthy breakfast. Oh. Sandy? I'm a bit of a, bit of a combination of the two, I must admit, although I, I don't keep up with the running. Sarah, I take the dogs for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll just pop the snapshot up now for everyone. We um, And what we've got, we've got a clear winner in our poll is the cup of tea or coffee. Um, and there have been some things in the chat as well. And some of them include meditation, getting in contact with your spiritual connections. Um, also, also chatting with with staff and colleagues and families as well. And just making sure, I like, I particularly like this one as well, just making sure you have enough time, have enough time in the, in the day, so making time for that, for the day ahead. Okay, so I think we'll close that poll now and move on to the next section where Penny will be exploring the learning outcomes for today. So also have a think about what you, what learning outcomes you'd like for today. All right, thanks Amelia. Um, I think that's the wrong slide. Uh, yeah, right, we're right now. So one of the things we just have to remember is that um, all of us are at different stages in our professional lives. So some of what we're going to go through today um, may not be new to you, and for other people it might be quite new. So we encourage you to use the chat box to share your stories, and we look forward to your contribution to these outcomes. So basically, we We've got three particular aims. One is that you go away from the webinar either having learnt more or confirming your understanding of why self-regulation is so important to children's development, learning and mental health. And then you also go away with some ideas about how you can effectively support self-regulation in early childhood. And then lastly that you um, have an awareness of what the Kids Matter materials resources framework can do to help you in this area. So we're going to start off just by thinking what do we mean by this term and on the screen there you'll see two um, descriptions or definitions. And the first one on the left is from Stuart Shanker who has undertaken considerable work in this area and later in the webinar Sarah is going to explain aspects of his approach and why he differentiates between self-control and self-regulation. Although in many books and articles, you'll find that the, ch the uh, two terms are used interchangeably. However, most references to self-regulation talk about a range of characteristics and abilities that help a child to manage their thinking, their attention, their feelings, and their behavior. So the second um, description on the right is from Kids Matter. It's an information handout for families and early childhood staff entitled Keeping a Balance, Managing Feelings and Behaviour. And its reference to the idea of balance is a helpful one to think about and we'll refer to that later. So sometimes self-regulation is also called 
executive functions or an air traffic control system because it organises the way in which the brain helps us to regulate our attention, our feelings and our behaviour. And it involves being able to inhibit, um, calling on working memory and using cognitive flexibility. And sometimes people call this stop and think. Ellen Galinsky in her book Mind in the Making, she gives an example of four-year-olds in the game playing the game Simon Says with a bit of a twist and says that the way in which these four-year-olds respond gives a strong indication of their progress with self-regulation skills of focused attention, how they can listen to instructions, controlling their impulses, their ability to inhibit, and their working memory, holding their things in their head. She adds that research indicates that the children at about four who are most successful in this go on to show better results later in literacy learning. So we, we can ask ourselves then, oh, sorry, wrong slide. We seem to have lost the slide there, Amelia. No, oh, sorry, beg your pardon. So why focus um, the current focus on self-regulation? So in, in 2012, Stuart Shanker wrote, just about everywhere you turn these days, you come across someone talking about the importance of enhancing children's ability to self-regulate. This is because of a growing number of studies showing that self-regulation lays a foundation for a child's long-term physical, psychological, behavioural and educational well-being. In a report in the New York Times in 2014, David Bornstein described a program teaching children to calm themselves because of the increasing prevalence of chronic childhood adverse adversity and its effect on behaviour. He added that one of the biggest lessons for teachers and parents who undergo the training to help children is that the very first step is learning how to calm and care for themselves. And we'll talk more about that later. Because of the evidence from research, particularly about the brain, we now know much more about how important self-regulation skills are to children's successful learning and development. And because this knowledge has highlighted how critical these skills are, it has led to an urgency among those interested in early childhood to find out more and to link this to their practice particularly in supporting those children who have difficulty learning these skills. And the evidence from the research, together with questions being asked by practitioners and experts about whether many current behaviour management practices are effective, has led many to challenge existing practice and to look for other ways to understand young children's behaviour. There's also much discussion about an increase in the stresses in environments environments for young children, including things like the effects of screen time and other electronic devices, the busyness of adults, economic pressures on families, family breakdown, etc. And what effect these have on the development of self-regulation skills. So let's have a, a look now a little more closely at the brain and self-regulation. Now this is a complex area and um, we've tried to simplify it bit by using this um, diagram. So the diagram is from Dan Siegel and Tina Payne Bryson's book, The Whole Brain Child. And my colleague Janelle Bowler used it in our webinar on managing emotions. And so if you see in the diagram you'll see the staircase. So imagine the brain is having an upstairs and a downstairs. And the more basic downstairs part develops earlier and controls many of the things that keep us alive like breathing, heart rate and sleep. This is also where the flight, fight, freeze response comes from when people feel threatened. So the upstairs brain, near the top of our head, develops later and is where the more intricate mental processes take place, including things like decision making, planning, control over our thinking and body, self-understanding, empathy and morality. So regulating behaviour and emotions requires access to the upstairs brain, but this can be blocked when someone is experiencing strong positive or negative emotions. In young children, the upstairs brain is very much under construction and the hot demanding part of the brain, the emotional limbic system, easily takes over. 
So stress impacts our ability to access our upper thinking brain. And the younger the child, the more chronic the stress, the greater the impact. The most important experience for children is the quality of close relationships. The emotional brain sits somewhere in the middle but is also found in areas throughout the brain which are con consequently moderated and affected by the emotional brain. Close relationships are both bathed in emotions and they <clears throat> provide skills and support for emotional regulation. So just imagine the emotional brain as being like a filter for incoming and outgoing information. And emotions are attached to all the experiences we have. Dan Siegel says the key to helping children thrive is to help all the parts of the brain to work together. And the brain is constantly seeking balance and integration. It's trying to link between upstairs and downstairs, left and right, and memories. Integration enables the left and the right brain to work as a team, and the upstairs and downstairs brain to support each other. One of Dan's ideas to connect the upstairs and downstairs brain, for example, is move it or lose it, which confirms the idea of children needing regular movement in order to learn and grow. The prefrontal cortex, which is part of the thinking brain, is located just behind the forehead and acts like an air traffic control system which is central to the process of balance and integration and the development of the skills of self-regulation. The skills that we teach children will hopefully get the goal-oriented prefrontal cor cortex to kick in first before the demanding immediate gratification of the limbic system. So strategies like self-talk and moving the body can help the, the part of the brain that is super activated in fear and anger to calm enough to enable access to the upstairs brain again. So if we understand in what ways behaviour is a result of what is happening in the brain, we're more able to help a child to develop effective skills to manage that behaviour. In other words, to self-regulate. And when children can't um, when the brain is not integrated, they're not getting the sort of feedback and things they need, then they tend to go to things that have worked for them before and we know what kinds of effects um, that might have. So how does self-regulation develop? Well, a child's ability to develop the skills they need is influenced by their age and their temperament and their experience. So learning begins in the womb and progresses from external to internal self-regulation. So our final goal is that the child is internally self-regulated with gradually decreasing support necessary from adults and the environment. But relationships are absolutely central to this process. And individual differences in self-regulation can emerge very early in life and they're often related to the temperament of the child. This can be seen, for example, in babies who are difficult to soothe or demonstrate proneness to fear. So children are going to need different kinds of support. So it's important that adults hold developmentally appropriate expectations for children's behaviour and that they also appreciate the effects of both temperament and experience on their behaviour. Siegel and Bryson suggest that challenging behaviour in children is often an indication that a child can't do something rather than they won't do something. If we believe that, then we look very differently at, at the behaviour they're demonstrating. So self-regulated children can delay gratification and manage their impulses long enough to think ahead to the possible consequences of their action or to think about alternative actions that would be more appropriate. Their ability to do this depends on their maturation of the brain, as I said, and their experience. We know that children under three, for example, find it very hard to delay gratification and they're often overwhelmed by their emotions. Whatever actions we take to assist children need to be focused on trying to understand what is causing their behaviour and how this is linked to their stage of development. So to summarise at this point, difficulties with self-regulation affect all aspects of children's learning and development. Children who have difficulty with self-regulation also tend to have trouble with learning and that are risk, at risk for problems with aggression, social skills and self-awareness. 
And self-regulation in surveys has been ranked by teachers as the most important characteristic for school readiness. Difficulty with self-regulation is a risk factor for mental health and well-being, and brain research has helped us to understand more fully why this is so. So Sandy will now link our discussion uh, with further comments about mental health and the Kids Matter Framework. Thanks, Penny. I uh, just wanted to briefly look at how self-regulation and mental health fit together. And we see from this definition of early childhood mental health, which Kids Matter Early Childhood uses, that self-regulation is really integral to children's mental health and well-being. Anecdotally too, when I've asked educators to describe a mentally healthy child, they'll usually describe self-regulating behaviour, emotions or thoughts or thoughts, things like a child being able to express how they're feeling, being able to calm themselves or play happily with other children. Certainly difficulties in emotional and behavioural self-regulation that occur often across a number of settings and over long periods of time can be warning signs that mental health difficulties may be present. Some of the signs of self-regulation difficulties in children include ongoing difficulties with concentration, things like being unable to listen to a story, uh, looking very sad and uninterested in daily activity, or becoming easily upset and worried so that they're not able to move on. And certainly better self-regulation skills in early childhood lead to better social skills and better mental health. Relationships. There is more and more evidence emerging about the critical role that relationships play in the development of self-regulation, also personality, self-esteem, physical health and learning. In fact, Jack Chonkov, the director of the Harvard Centre on the Developing Ch Child, says that there's no development without relationships, which I find a really powerful statement. No development happens without relationships. Relationships are the foundation of children's mental health and wellbeing, and certainly kids, kids matter is underpinned by the importance of positive relationships with children, families, staff and community. And I think you'll all agree, and it's supported by research, that relationships are at the heart of quality early childhood education and care. So perhaps the questions we need to be asking are, how do we build positive relationships with children? How do we develop strong connections? And how do we privilege these relationships and make them a priority of our work? I've used this slide from a previous webinar and was taken them for, um, which I really like because I think it shows some great examples of positive relationships between adults and children. It shows adults responding to children, um, showing that they know and are accepting of the child as an individual and are available for that ch child. And using a circle of security language, we, also, we can also see them as examples of relationships involving adults who are bigger, stronger, wiser and kind. Now, adults. <laughs> Jess Matter recognises that children learn through relationships with important people in their lives, such as their parents and educators. So how and who do educators need to be to help develop children's self-regulation? Okay, look, I've listed at the top relations as a focus, which we have really already talked about, the importance of developing those strong connections, um, making them a priority and being bigger, stronger, wiser in time. But our own adult self-regulation is critical too. It's, it's critical for our own well-being and also to support children's self-regulation. So it's important for educators to be able to understand and manage their own emotions, to be able to calm themselves, not simply react to children's behaviour. So this might look like taking a couple of seconds to breathe and think through what's going on for the child and for you and how you can respond in a calm way and how can you help the child cope. Uh, some questions that you might like to reflect on um, and which yes, I've certainly found helpful are things such as how do you know when you're feeling overwhelmed or stressed? What is it that pushes your buttons and what aspects of children's behaviour do you react to? And what do you do to help keep yourself calm and manage your own emotions? Does it work? What else could you try? Children are very good at copying and learning from adults. So when adults are effectively managing their own feelings and behaviour, 
They're showing children healthy ways to cope and how to manage emotions and behaviour. Talking out loud to describe your own self-regulation can be helpful too. Um, like after a busy morning, you might say, oh, it's been such a busy morning with so much going on, I'm going to take a deep breath and count to five before I move on. Thirdly, a better understanding of self-regulation and the development of pathways will help recognise what is age appropriate for children in terms of self-regulation. Development of self-regulation can be slow and variable just, just as with other skills. And I think often um, many adults overestimate the ability of young children to manage their, their emotions and their behaviour on their own. I'm going to hand over in just a minute to Sarah Thomas. We'll be talking about self-regulation and self-control before we all um, have a look at the case study about Chris. But before I do that, let's hear briefly and learn from some young children about how they feel when they're angry and what they do about it. This is a short clip from a YouTube video called Just Breathe. Blood keeps pumping because you're like really mad. And you start to get sweaty because you're getting really, really mad. And then when you start getting really mad, you turn red. When your body can't really control yourself, mad just takes over your body. I just get out of control. Sometimes I close my eyes or just take deep breaths. It's like it's calming down, it's like not like moving. It's like slowing down and then it stops. And the heart plumps slow and then it goes into your brain. It's like all the sparkles are at the bottom of your brain. My brain like slows down and then like I feel more calm and then I'm like ready to speak to the, that person. Mm -hmm. That is a great video, isn't it? So Sarah is going to speak with us now a little bit about self-regulation and self-control and how they connect and how they're different. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. It's been interesting to read um, some of the comments that have been going up on the, the, the chat box there. So hopefully I'll be able to um, answer some of those questions. And if not, then we can um, hopefully get to them in some of our follow-up information anyway. Um, so something that is often discussed is this difference between self-regulation and self-control. So when we're talking about self-regulation, we're wanting to um, really, re really referring to that ability to bring the body back to a calm and alert state in response to stresses. Um, so when we're talking about what is a stressor, which has, that word has been used a few times um, today already, we're talking about something that triggers a response from the body, and it might be in um, in one or more of the different domains. So it could be a biological. Um, uh, occurrence, an emotional one, a cognitive, social and pro-social. So examples of these might include um, sensitivity to loud sounds or particular touch or a lowered ability to maintain attention for um, extended periods of time, which I know can be a challenge for lots of children. Um, so as we've kind of spoken about this morning, how, or this, or speaking about this afternoon, but how do you actually self-regulate your body for ready for the morning, what do you think are your own stresses? So it might be things like if you're running late, you're feeling stressed. How do you regulate your body to get yourself ready to go again? Um, it might be a stress that you haven't had your coffee in the morning or you haven't been to that run in the morning or you haven't had a good night's sleep. And all those kinds of stresses are things that are really going to um, impact you if you don't get your body back to a calm and alert state. So really recognising what your own stresses are is important for us then to be able to help children to recognise what their stresses are as well. Uh, and then in, in comparison to that, we're looking at this term of um, self-control. So a definition of this one is a learned behaviour which involves being able to manage um, your own responses to events and people. And this is using skills including understanding verbal and nonverbal cues, 
um, understanding language and the ability to solve problems um, in a methodical way and really um, looking at the differences between the two. I, I won't spend too much time on it now but there is a link at the bottom of the slide here um, which will come out in your resources too um, to a video where Dr Stuart Shanker discusses the difference between the two which um, if you have the time I would really recommend going in and having a look at that just to get a better understanding of it because it can be, they, those two terms can be used interchangeably um, depending on where it is that you look um, and what research you've been um, getting into. So really it's, it's something to have a look at and, and get your head around a bit more. There's something to remember um, when we're using these two terms um, in different ways is that the better a child can self-regulate or deal with stresses, the more energy they're going to have left to learn those self-control skills. That is something that we need to keep in mind. And of course, as educators, if we're focusing on self-control skills, um, this might lead to us um, lead us into a different response of um, in response to what a child actually needs. So we might place those unrealistic expectations on the child or use inappropriate strategies, whereas self-regulation skills need to be developed in a supportive way to help guide children to understand their body's responses to the stresses. And also keeping in mind that a lowered ability to self-regulate doesn't come from a lack of effort and that it is an ongoing process that um, will take years to develop in an, up to an optimal level. And that optimal level is going to be different for each person as well. So there are lots of different definitions of self-regulation as well, um, depending on where you look, um, what research you go into. Um, the information that I'm sharing today is from the works of Dr. Stuart Shankar. So um, he does have a book out there that you can read if you want to get, get your mind into a little bit more called Calm, Alert and Learning. Um, and that link will be in our resources as well. Um, so when, when he's looking at self-regulation, he's looking at um, some of these abilities involved are attaining, maintaining and changing one's level of energy to match the demands of a task or situation. Um, so being able to modify your energy level and state of arousal to suit the activity that you're taking part in. So for example, a child uh, may be able to adapt their energy and arousal levels to suit the activity or this might take a lot more effort for them to be able to do that. Um, so this may be from um, the high end arousal state needing, needed for running outside and playing active games and being able to shift into that calmer arousal state. Um, and I noticed some of those things in the chat box as well, the idea of that some children do struggle with those transitions um, and understanding that they need to move from one activity to the next and perhaps that needs a lowered um, arousal state. So um, that idea that some children are going to struggle more with that and are going to need more guidance and, and support in those areas. Um, and so the second ability involves that monitoring and evaluating and modifying one's emotions. So for example, a child being able to calm themselves down after something has upset them and actually being able to move forward after that emotional upset. Uh, and children can be supported to develop their ability to communicate and appropriately express their emotions to suit the environment that they're in. Again, some children are going to find this easier to do than others. Um, that some children will need lots and lots of guidance and, and help in that area, whereas other children will be able to do that more naturally. Um, another area is that idea of being able to sustain and shift one's attention when necessary and ignoring distractions, which is something, um, again, that some children do struggle to do more than others. So being able to maintain attention to complete what is required of them. And again, this comes down to us understanding our children and knowing what it is that we actually want them to um, want, want them to be achieving and setting those realistic goals for them. So being able to move from uh, one task to another um, and, and being able to be engaged in that inappropriate, in an appropriate manner as well. Understanding both the meaning of a variety of social interactions and how to engage in them in a sustained way. So being able to participate in a range of different social interactions. So for example, using appropriate interactions within a conversation with a peer, both being, being both a listener and a speaker. And children can be obviously supported to develop those problem solving skills that allow them to deal effectively with, with issues that arise in those social interactions. And the fifth one um, is that connecting and caring about what other, other people are thinking and feeling and being able to empathise with them. So for example, children can develop an awareness of, of others around them and, and many of them need our support and guidance in that area. 
and the appropriate actions um, can be learned which allow children to respond to and comfort others when they're showing particular emotions. Um, and again, it's understanding where children need support in all of these areas for us to be able to help them as, as effective um, educators. So you might think to yourself, um, you know, which areas of these do you feel are easier to recognise than others? And definitely uh, in my experience as an as a educator myself, um, being able to see that difference between a child, um, you know, already I guess the fact that it's come up in the chat box there, that child being able to shift from one experience to another um, and being able to change their energy levels, that's a really, um, in my eyes, quite an obvious one that you can see, um, you know, the child who's bouncing through and, and not quite calming down, ready for the next activity. So in my view, that is one that I definitely think is quite a, an obvious one that we can see quite easily in our practices. <coughs> Okay, so looking at the, the case study for today, what can we actually see from Chris's behaviour? So some of the language that's uh, used in this case study write-up, um, yeah, so we've got the words boisterous and bosses others and fighting when he doesn't get, um, get his way, finding it difficult to sit quietly, shouting out, and then a lovely positive in there that he's quite good at ball games. Um, when we're writing, um, when we're reading these kinds of case studies, consideration does need to um, be given to moving towards what the behaviour is actually telling us and moving away from a negative attitude towards the behaviour. So wording um, with things like he likes to get up to mischief and he just won't sit still, you can see that those negative kinds of tones are coming through there. So looking at those points that we just spoke about in the last slide, um, and we'll be able to link those across to these behaviours that we've seen in Chris. So that ability to attain, maintain and change one's energy level to match the demands of the task or situation, we can see that through this wording that's been used that he's quite a boisterous child. So boisterous might be fantastic if they're running outside and being engaged in some kind of an active game and they're, they're in there and taking part in it, but perhaps not so relevant, um, not so appropriate um, inside in a quiet activity. So thinking about how that might be an appropriate um, behaviour in some situations, whereas it might not be for another. Um, and also that idea that he's finding it difficult to sit quietly. Um, so that shifting of, of his energy levels to suit the activity there. Um, being able to monitor, evaluate and modify one's emotions. So here that links to the fact that he's biting if he doesn't get his way. Um, and then that ability to shift and um, shift his attention and ignore distractions. So he's finding it difficult again to sit quiet, um, sit quietly, and getting into um, getting those distractions with the lunch boxes. I think was another example from from the case study there as well. And understanding both the meaning of a variety of social interactions and how to engage in them in a sustained way. So bossing others around. Um, biting when he doesn't get his own way, again that those links to that need of guidance in the area of social interactions and that idea of um, you know, whether or not it's an appropriate thing to be shouting out at others and, and giving him guidance in there. And then the last point is that connecting with and caring about what others are thinking and feeling and that ability to empathise and act accordingly. So bossing others around, again that links to there and that shouting out. Now you can see from the messiness of this slide, it is not how I would normally present my slides, um, but thinking about how this child might be feeling, if you've got all of these examples down the side here of areas of need um, that this child might be needing help and guidance in, and then there's all these examples of behaviours that are showing that, you can imagine how much is going on in this child's mind trying to cope with and deal with the, the experiences and um, activities that he's been faced with each day. So there are a lot of points in there where this child could actually be getting some help. So um, thinking about, I guess, when you're presented with a, a child that you could be helping, where would you even start with this? Which behaviour do you think you would try and focus on first and which need do you think you need to cover first? And, and those are the kinds of considerations that we would be um, you know, giving ourselves, thinking of ourselves when we're approaching a, a real child, not just a, a case study here. Okay. So some stresses, uh, this is just looking at the self-regulation cycle, but looking at um, when a stressor occurs, 
And this is where um, we've spoken about those stresses before. It might be a loud noise. It might be a social interaction. It might be um, having to maintain attention for extended periods of time. All of those things are the stresses. And from here, I'll just get my, my pointer here. So we've got our stresses occurring at the top here. And then our body is responding to those stresses. Now, our body might respond in, in different ways. Our body might respond um, to be hyper alert. It might um, respond to be hypo alert. Um, and that's an area that we can have a look into, perhaps with some of the resources that will um, come through with the information after the webinar. But looking at how our body can respond in different ways. And then what we would generally do if we had the skills is we work to regulate our body and then our body returns back to a calm and alert state. And this is that self-regulation self cycle. Again, a, and even if you have those self-regulating skills, these stresses are still occurring and we're still doing things to move our body through them. So when we're looking at Chris's self-regulation cycle, you can see here that he perhaps doesn't, uh, a stress is occurring, so we're asking him to perhaps sit still for an extended period of time. His body is actually responding to that um, in in what may appear to be quite a negative um, a negative way. So a behaviour um, that we might not see as communicating a need, but a behaviour perhaps that he's not doing what he's asked to do because he's, respond, he's responding to the stresses that are placed upon him. Um, and the fact that he doesn't know how to regulate his body then means that his body is struggling to return back to a calm and alert state. So you can imagine the... Um, the confidence in himself and the impact that's going to be having on his mental health and that security in his connections with others. So in the case study it does speak about how his parents are often yelling at him to behave and so his interactions and relationships with others around him um, are becoming quite negative from what we can gather from the case study. Um, and then this is then um, showing through in his interactions with others where he's shouting at others and bossing them around um, and other children don't warm to him easily. So some of that wording from the case study there, you can see that it's, it is having an impact. So if we're looking at what are Chris's stresses, so having, having to match his energy level to the activity, so understanding that there are different energy levels needed for different experiences um, and that he's obviously struggling to be able to change those along the way throughout the day. Dealing with strong emotions um, is a clear stressor for him and the fact that he's um, you know, biting others when he's not getting his way um, and his, that lack of ability to recognise feelings in others and understanding that others may want their way too. Um, ignoring distractions, so that idea that he um, is quite um, up and moving around during lunch times and looking at other people's lunch boxes and not able to um, ignore those other distractions that are happening around him, that are obviously quite exciting for him. And being part of a two-way interaction, so um, the, the notes about him shouting and perhaps needing to use more appropriate communication and, and not shouting out when he wants something. And then another stressor of recognising others' emotions um, and again that looking back to the biting and the bossing others around. Um, so some of those things you might be able to see um, in the children that you work with as well. So really thinking about what is, if you're seeing those behaviours coming out in the children that you're working with, what is it actually trying to tell you and what can, we, what can you find out about that child and, and work with them to develop in. So when we're looking at any child's behaviour, um, when we're obviously referring to Chris today, but when you're looking at any of the children's behaviour that you're working with, we can be looking at identifying their needs. So today we've looked at identifying some of Chris's needs. He needs guidance in lots of those areas of self-regulation. And we can look for what the stresses are that are causing those changes in the child's state of arousal and that are behaviours being displayed. We can work on reducing stresses where possible. So for the, for the example of Chris, we could look at opportunities where perhaps we can get him to move his body more um, so that he can kind of burn off some of that excess energy and really get some of that sensory input. And there are lots of fantastic programs out there that you could um, you know, find through the many professionals that you can gather information from to really get that sensory input and get the children um, to be using their bodies um, and then for us to be supporting him to help regulate his body. So lots of supportive language and exposure to learning experiences. And some children might actually need that physical guidance in that as well. So there's lots of ideas there that 
um, that you could be using to help guide and, and develop a child's behaviour, um, understanding of their own behaviours and, and self-regulating, moving towards self-regulation, I should say. And remembering that if it is something that you do need to physically help a child with, that keeping in mind some of the sense of policies and communications with families to really make sure that everybody is on the same page with those, um, with those um, assistance that we can give to the children. And then aiming towards him being able to regulate his body independently. And I did see this come up as a, as a chat question of um, are we trying to aim towards self-regulation or a combination of you know, self-regulation and co-regulation. And um, a, a response that was put up there I think by might have been Janelle um, saying that there are times in our lives where we do rely on other people to help us regulate our bodies when we are extremely stressed or going through an adverse um, experience where we are having to you know, have those moments to chat with somebody else. And it's not to say that you won't ever need support from anyone else, but definitely for children, we can build lots of their self-regulation skills so they are more aware of what's happening in their bodies um, and then we can be helping them progress and, and cope with things in a, um, in a more appropriate manner. And remembering that they're not going to learn these skills overnight and they, they won't even learn these skills within the time that they are just in your care. So that's why I guess a, a centre-wide approach is so critical. Um, so you could have those transition, transitions from one room to the next and one educated to the next where everybody is on board and everybody understands what this child's needs are. Um, so for Chris, he might have you know, three different educators with him throughout the day where everybody needs to understand what his needs are and everybody can be helping to teach those self-regulating skills. And it might be things like, like that have been mentioned with the deep breathing, the meditation and relaxation techniques. Um, and these, these steps will support children becoming calm and alert and ready for learning um, throughout the day as well as progressing their skills overall. And the development of self-regulating skills absolutely comes through appropriate modelling um, from ourselves as educators, through guidance and communication and definitely a highly supportive environment. And moving away from that negative view of, of the behaviour into the view of what is this behaviour actually telling us. Um, and, and, and that in itself can have a positive effect on our own mental health as educators. If we're looking at behaviours in a negative view, um, that can definitely get us down. Um, as educators, if we're looking at it, okay, this is what the behaviour is telling us. Um, that we can actually provide for those needs and move forward from that. Okay, I'll hand back over to Sandy now to share some more on the Kids Matter view. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. And I'd just really like to echo that last thought about what, um, really thinking about what is the child's behaviour telling us um, can actually help change our thoughts about how we view the child and what's going on as well. Look, I wanted to have a quick look at self-regulation um, using the Kids Better framework um, and think, use this to think about how we can respond to Chris. The circles in the slide here represent four key areas where Kids Better has identified that educators can take focus and, well, can focus on and take further action to support children's mental health and wellbeing. The first one, the red one, about creating a sense of community is about inclusive practices based on a foundation of positive relationships. So when we're thinking about Chris, perhaps we could be asking ourselves some of the some questions like does he have a sense of belonging and connectedness here and what are his relationships like with the other children, the educators? Are all the interactions that we have with Chris focused on his behaviour or are, um, are there other positive interactions with him and other conversations? Um, the blue circle is about working with parents and carers. And I don't really get a sense of what sort of relationship there is between Chris's parents and um, the educators. And whether in fact the, the parents feel connected to the early childhood service or whether there are barriers preventing this. But certainly um, it could be a good focus to work on developing a relationship and a partnership with parents. Um, to have those ongoing conversations and share some, share their concerns and strategies about working together for Chris. The yellow circle are uh, about developing children's social and emotional skills. I guess there are a number of indicators that suggest that Chris would benefit from specific social and emotional skill development, um, things such as developing friendships, understanding other, other children's emotions, 
um, joining in group. And it may be that he hasn't had the opportunity to learn these skills before, or maybe that that disease of skills where he needs more practice and more scaffolding than than other children to learn them. So once again, if we think about reframe some of his behaviours, such as the difficulty joining in and playing in a group with other children as actually unlearned skills, then we can think about differently about his behaviour and focus on teaching him those skills just as we would other ones. And when we think about this, it doesn't have to be an addition to the curriculum, but really making the most of what's already going on. Uh, and I think starting with Chris's strength, you know, he's fit, athletic, he loves being outside, he's great at all skills. And how can he use those strengths to actually um, tap in and develop his social and emotional skills? Um, because there are many ways that um, that you can look at doing that, but it will obviously be more effective when it's done together. So when the educators um, discuss and talk about this together, and also together with parents as well. Um, we have talked about um, calmness, but to be one idea is to consider introducing mindfulness. Children and educators can all enjoy and benefit from this. But remembering too that mindfulness practice can be done in many ways. Okay, it's about helping Chris to notice how he is feeling in the moment, um, and that you don't have to be still to be calm. The green circle, um, which focuses more on individual children, where you may have some concerns, and I'm going to have a look at it in a bit more detail. Um, Observations are one of the many ways that educators identify children's strengths and needs. And through observations, you can see what Chris is doing, see what he's coping with, what he's enjoying, finding easy and where he might need more support. Taking time to observe Chris doing everyday things can help us understand the meaning behind his behaviour. Um, and Kismet has created this tool to help record what you're seeing and find patterns that will help us to understand what's going on for Chris. Uh, called the Beatles, which is an acronym for behaviour, emotions, thoughts, learning and social relationships, which are important things to observe in, in a child that you might um, have some concerns about. The Beatles, it's a template for gathering and documenting information and observations about a child and the particular concerns. Um, also look to include uh, details such as pervasiveness, so who is impacted by the behaviour, where does it happen and when does it happen? Persistence, so how long has it been going on for? How often do we do you see this behaviour? And how much does this behaviour impact on the child and others? Um, just remember it's not a diagnostic tool, okay? When the information is collected, we can decide where to go from there. Maybe talk to our colleagues about particular strategies or a more experienced educator. We might speak to the family further um, and raise them those concerns in sensitive ways, and we might also at this point consider other professions with their thinking as well. So I'm going to hand over here to Penny for her um, thoughts about Chris. Okay, thanks Sandy. Um, when I was thinking about Chris and how we could help, I um, for myself sort of grouped the things I thought about into four main areas. and. Sarah and Sandy already referred to some of these in what they've said, but I think observation, really careful, curious observation, you know, it makes us look very carefully at a child and tune in to them. We see things that we otherwise might not see, and as busy educators, we need to take time to just be with children. I know this is hard, but if we really value it, we'll work out ways with our colleagues to try and do it. And at the same time, I think we need a good mental map of what the skills, social emotional skills are so that we know in action every day, right through the day, we can help children and give them the support we need because we've got a mental model of what the skills are that we need to develop. And there are resources in Kids Matter which help you with this. And when you're using a tool like the Beatles that, Sandra, that Sandy mentioned, asking yourself all the time, what might this child be feeling and what might he be thinking and not just what is he doing? And I think that helps us to look differently. And so the other area 
using words and gestures and touch as cues. I think that there are lots of ways that we can give signals to children that we're noticing, that we're aware of them, that we can keep them safe, that we can give them help with what they need. And naming and acknowledging their feelings and setting limits, but all at the same time thinking of opportunities and ways of moving the body and things that will actually take them back to that calm, alert state. And so another one is providing lots of opportunities for practice and engaging opportunities. I think Dan Siegel talks about engaging, not enraging. And it's increasing the fun factor, using those things he's really good at, like the ball games, etc., to give him an important sense of being a competent person. So searching for ways to engage in fun ways and giving lots of encouragement and specific feedback about what he's doing well. And then that other area of really demonstrating and model, modeling and being an adult who de actually practices what they preach, so to speak, and helping him notice what other children do that's successful. And doing things like what I like to talk about is descriptive commenting, which is used by some people. And it's like a sports cast. And you're kind of providing Chris with um, a, a commentary on what other people are doing, what's happening, what might be happening himself, etc., so that he's getting a sense of the story about himself that he can then start gradually understanding more and taking himself back to calm and alert state. And using tools like Tucker Turtle, some of you might have heard of, to actually being able to himself withdraw, take those deep breaths, practice being the turtle, knowing when he can come back and engage again. And so I also thought after thinking about Chris that um, we're talking about an individual there but we also, I think Sarah mentioned this, we want to think about what are the skills that we want to help all children with. And I quite like this little um, summary that Forrester and Albrecht give and that's in your reference list that you'll get. And the first area is to really control or regulate the emotional and physical impulses that children experience. There's lots and lots of learning, as Sarah has shown us, in learning how to do that. And that second one is to tolerate frustration, to know what you can do when frustrated. And in the chat, a lot of you have given examples there. Being able to delay gratification to knowing how to wait. And in our managing emotion strategy um, webinar, there are lots of examples in there of what you can do to help that. And then finally, to let the children think ahead by making and implementing these first very simple plans with them, um, documenting them, doing it pictorially, so they can get that sense of what's coming ahead, what I need to work towards. Okay, everyone. Now, we, we've got a few more moments left to go. I'll just pop a poll up quickly, um, just asking you to have a consideration around what, what you'll take away from, with you today and what you'll actually maybe give a go at. So I'll just start that poll and while, while people are filling that out, we might just have a little bit of a chat um, about different things that have been coming up throughout the webinar. So we've, we've had lots of different conversations and lots of conversations about parenting and, and how to develop relationships with parents that have come up. The one thing that just recently popped up, Penny, could you just clarify the turtle, Tucker the turtle for us again? Yeah, the turtle, um, it's either a method you can use, you just teach them through a picture of a turtle or whatever, or you can make an actual turtle shell and model the children taking time out themselves, crawling under the shell, being the turtle, breathing in and out, learning how to calm themselves and gradually um, moving from using, having to use a model to using, using it themselves. There's a story that goes with it. You can find a reference to it on the web and the story. Yep. And I've used a puppet that really helps children to do that as well. Okay, cool. Excellent. Thank you. So, and Sarah, I've noticed you've been a little bit active on the chat with people as well. What, from, from things that have popped up in the chat, have you got any comments you'd like to make? Um, I think Working with parents um, is a, uh, can be seen as a massive, um, I guess, barrier to helping the child. And and I guess my my comment that was in there is that our role as educators is so much more than just working with the children, um, which 
you know, we're talking about our own self-regulation and, and managing our own health and well-being. Our job really is never ending and I guess making sure that you are looking after yourself um, as well as trying to be the best educator you possibly can be um, and supporting those families because they are the ones who are with the children, um, you know, so many hours of the day as well. So, you know, the impact we can make with them is such an important one as well. Excellent. Thank you. And we've had a lot of people respond and, and it's pretty even across the board to what people are are going to take away with them as well. Now we've run out of time for questions and comments and I am aware that, that we've hit the zero mark so I'll, what we'll do, we haven't been able to have a final thought from, from each of our presenters tonight so what I might do is I might just pop the final thoughts up on a Facebook post straight away after this webinar finishes so that, so that you can share the, the take home comments that our uh, presenters have had tonight and I might even pop in one of my own too because something popped up for me as we're going. So I would like to really encourage you all to continue these conversations in your places and in your spaces and also with us online and here are the, all the different ways that we can we can be connected with you and you can connect with us. So thank you once again to Sarah and Sandy and Penny for, for spending the time with us this afternoon in giving us a very, very very full and very vibrant um, walk through self-regulation. Thanks a lot again and thank you everyone for participating tonight. You will be receiving a certificate in the next in the next little bit. Does everyone want to just say goodbye and presenters, are you still there? I don't know. You've, yeah. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> I'll well, I'll say goodbye. <laughs> but in a, in a moment you'll see that a survey has popped up. If you I've got more than one person watching this webinar with you and you would like a certificate, please make sure that you complete the name and email addresses of anyone who's in attendance today so that we can get an email to, to, you, to you and them as well. So I'll let everyone else say goodbye quickly. See you later. <laughs> thanks. I'm sorry for going a little bit over time everyone and thanks again presenters and thanks again for everyone participating. We'll see you next time.